for context, I am female and currently 21 years old, though at the time of this event I was 16 years old. I have never viewed myself as an attractive person. I've always been kind of chubby. I had bad acne in my teen years. I never cared at all what I wore, and I almost never wore makeup. I was an extremely awkward teen who had barely any friends and next to no self-esteem due to a very abusive relationship I had a few years prior, but that's a different story entirely. My point is that I was a completely different person during this time and looking back, I know how naive I was and what I should have done instead to better protect myself. So it was the year 2015 and I was going on my very first cruise with my family. It was an 8 days, 7 nights cruise that was taking place a few days after a tsunami had passed nearby. After a rocky start, literally the boat rocked back and forth the first two days and everyone was miserable, and me suffering a slight panic attack during a routine evasion drill, I'm claustrophobic and really hate crowds, it ended up being one of the best weeks of my life and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Some of the downsides to this cruise was the fact that it was a North State cruise taking place in October, which meant chilly weather and no swimming, and because it was during a school year, I was the only guest my age on that cruise. The closest age to me, I think, was either 6 years old or 40 years old, so that kind of stunk, although I did end up crushing hard on our assistant dinnertime waiter who was around 30 years old and had the sweetest smile I'd ever seen. Anyways, time to get to the meat of the story. So as far as I know, most cruises have at least one formal night where everyone dresses up really nice for dinner and they serve special meals like lobster, steak, etc. As I said before, I wasn't the most attractive person out there, but I did doll myself up for this special occasion. I wore a turquoise knee-length dress, tan-colored high heels, my mom curled my blonde hair, and I put on some makeup that really made my blue eyes pop. I honestly did feel kind of pretty that night. Dinner was amazing and I finally got to try lobster tail for the first time. Loved it. I also, of course, made eyes and mildly flirted with our assistant waiter. I made him laugh because of how red my face would get whenever my dad called me out on it. So after our dinner, my family and I all decided to go our separate ways for the night. There was a bunch of events going on that each of us wanted to get to. Well, except for me who spent most of the cruise finding random relaxing spots to sit and draw. I was, and I've always been, an avid artist. So anyways, after a couple of hours, I decided I wanted to find my dad for some reason that I don't exactly remember. My mom had told me that he was going to the karaoke thing going on, so I started making my way around the ship, looking for wherever this was happening at. That's when I met him. I noticed him staring at me, and at first it was flattering. Like I said, I was average looking and had next to no self-esteem, so having anyone of the opposite sex look at me and smiling made me feel good. He looked to be not too much older than I was and was dressed in a cruise employee uniform, so I decided to approach him and ask if he knew where the karaoke room was. His smile never left as I asked him, and in a thick Indian accent he told me that he didn't know, but that we could search together for it. I thought it was a little weird at first that he was an employee but didn't know where an event was taking place, but I brushed it off and thought it was possible for some newer employees to not know where everything was yet. So he and I started walking around the ship together and casually chatted while doing so. He told me his name was Felix and was 21 years old. He also, as I suspected, did recently start working for this cruise liner a few months ago. For the record, I did find him kind of cute and liked how comfortable he felt talking to me about his life. As we continued walking around, he told me about how he was born and raised in India, how his family was kind of poor, how rooster fights were illegal back home but he watched them anyways and stuff like that. I enjoyed listening to his stories about life in a different country, considering I've never been anywhere but America at this point in my life. We had eventually stopped looking for my dad and were just walking and talking together. We were now standing outside on the deck and leaning against the railing. I admired how beautiful and ominous the dark water reflected the stars. It was as if we were floating in the galaxy. It was completely beautiful. He then started telling me how lonely he was and how hard it is working on a cruise ship and watching hundreds of couples being romantic together while he has no one. 
I told him that I understood how he felt because I was also single and hated feeling alone. He looked at me and told me he was surprised that I don't have a boyfriend because of how beautiful I was. I blushed and looked away as I told him that most guys back home don't look at me twice and he was surprised by that. You know that feeling when someone or something is behind you and you can't see it but you know you can sense it's there. Well I felt something behind my head and when I turned around to find out what it was, before I realized what was happening, Felix's face was right in mine and he planted an unexpected kiss on me. I pulled back in surprise and he asked me what I thought about it. I stuttered nervously and tried to think of a reply. Now yes, I was a naive young person who was always looking positively at people but I wasn't completely stupid. This is a 21-year-old stranger who was flirting with a 16-year-old girl. I also had the sudden realization that no one knew where I was or who I was with. Before I could even say anything, Felix started telling me how he knew of a couple of spots on this ship where we could be alone to do things together. I started panicking and really wanted to get away from him. Now another fault of mine is that I'm way too nice for my own good and I'm always afraid of hurting people's feelings or coming across as a mean person, even when I'm clearly in a dangerous situation. I'm still too friendly to everyone now, but nowadays, I have much more of a backbone and wouldn't have a problem telling someone like Felix to kindly screw off. But as I said, I didn't have that confidence back then, and I had no clue how to get out of the situation. Felix put his arm around my waist and started guiding me toward one of the areas he was talking about. I started stuttering. Um, maybe we shouldn't. We just met and I... We might get caught and you'd be in trouble and... My father might be looking for me. I know that sounds dumb, but I was trying to make him think of ways where this could be bad for him. So it seemed like I was trying to look out for him. Don't judge me too harshly. He told me not to worry about it because people mess around with staff sometimes and their boss never finds out. That only made me panic even more. He leaned in for another kiss and I stupidly let him because I was scared of making him angry. After the long, uncomfortable kiss, I slightly turned away and told him I just wanted to keep looking at the night sky. He insisted that we should start messing around because we don't have much time together. I tried to hold back from crying at this point. And by the grace of the good lord above, my phone suddenly made a noise and I noticed my father had texted me asking where I was. I tried to mask my relief, but I immediately told Felix that I had to get going because my dad was wondering where I was and that he was very protective of me. Felix showed his disappointment to me saying that, but then he asked me for my phone number. My heart sank and I gave it to him. Again, stupid young female who doesn't know how to say no. I'm aware of how foolish that was. It was a good thing I didn't give him a fake though because he immediately texted my number to prove its authenticity. Once I thought he was satisfied, I started saying goodbye and walking away. He grabbed my wrists and spun me back toward him and asked for a hug goodbye first. I sheepishly agreed and gave him a light hug. I wanted to start crying when he squeezed me tight and pulled me against his groin and asked if I could feel it, if you know what I mean. I quickly stepped away and sped walked towards my hotel room. I made sure he didn't follow me and once I was safely inside my room, I hopped on my bed and started crying. Of course, I couldn't tell my parents about this because I would be in trouble for putting myself in this situation. Or so I thought. I promise my parents aren't really like that. I know now that in reality my former marine father would have tracked Felix down and let him know to never touch his daughter again. A few minutes into my cry and my phone vibrated with a text from an unknown number claiming it was Felix. I wanted to block him immediately but again, stupidly, I was afraid that would anger him and he would somehow find me. So I answered him and we talked for a few minutes. We kept talking about how he wanted to see me again before I left the next day, which at this point I repeatedly thanked God for and I kept telling him that it just wasn't possible because my parents didn't want me leaving my room for the rest of the night which was a lie. I did eventually end up leaving my room and asked an older female employee where the karaoke event was, which she immediately took me to. Side note, the room was literally two hallways down from where I first found Felix, and I kicked myself for that later. I found my dad and didn't leave his side for the whole rest of the night. 
Luckily, I was able to enjoy the rest of my night dancing around with my father, and I did hide around him whenever I spotted Felix walking around, who was making it obvious that he was looking for me. I know the story isn't as scary as the most on here, but at the time, it was terrifying to me, and my own kindness could have got me into a very bad situation. The moral to my story is that everyone needs to be careful when going on cruises or other types of vacations. Just because someone wears an employee uniform doesn't mean they're trustworthy. There's many people out there who take advantage of kind people and want to use that against them. Just please make sure whoever you're with always knows where you are and don't put yourself into risky situations. Back in 2018, a couple of my frat brothers and I were partying down in Panama City over spring break. I was a sophomore at the time and I'd already gotten all my initial spring break excitement out of my way the previous year, so myself and my frat bros are mostly just taking it easy. Still partying, sure, but just not nearly as wild or dumb as our first year. Thing is, we can blatantly spot all the freshmen and it was pretty cringe thinking that that was what we looked like just the previous year. Those freshmen became the bane of our lives at some points, showing up and puking right as we're parlaying our way and hanging out with a bunch of hotties, generally making idiots of themselves and causing a bunch of nonsense drama. So at one point, we hook up with these girls from Tennessee who say they're going on a booze cruise and we managed to secure ourselves some invites. It was pretty dope for a while. The music was good, no one was asking for IDs while handing out the beer bottles and after a while, we all started jumping into the water for a swim. Granted, I know that drinking and swimming is a really dumb thing to do, but I'm pretty sure it was only confident swimmers that decided to get in, and besides, the whole drinking and swimming thing wasn't even the danger. Because in the distance, we can see these jet skis approaching, and as they pull up, we can basically tell that these kids are either straight freshmen or just incredibly dumb. They're asking to party with us, but the boat is at capacity, and then they ask for some beers, and they're turned down. They seem to take this on the chin at first, but after a while they start turning nasty, hurling insults, revving their jet skis past us. It gets to the point that they're like swooping past us, getting closer and closer to the people swimming in the water. We're calling out to them, warning them that they're slowly getting near to colliding with one of our swimmers, but I think the engines of the jet skis were just too loud for them to hear. It gets to the point where people are climbing back onto the boat because they just don't feel safe and the captain is talking about calling the cops on these guys because they're obviously drunk and just came out to cause trouble. Then there's literally only one more person in the water, when one of these absolute idiots on the jet skis makes one last pass, super fast and super close to the boat. You heard the impact of his jet skis smashing into the girl when he hit her, like this big, hollow dump noise, and the screaming started. This kid is panicking, and he's revving his engine trying to turn away from the boat he only barely avoided colliding with. Then one of his revs catches something in the water. There's this horrible mechanical crunching sound, and then the water around his back end just starts turning red. People are seriously panicking by this point, but when this poor girl's body floats to the surface, and people see how the propeller blades of that jet ski had made mincemeat out of her head, people straight freaked. If I thought the screams were bad before, these new screams made the others sound like a choir of angels. Even the guys joined in, just absolutely horrified by what they saw. People are running to the other side of the boat to puke. One of the girl's friends is just absolutely inconsolable, wailing like a banshee while the people around her just don't know what to do. About an hour later, the place is just a small fleet of cops on boats and EMTs on boats. I mean, it was real bad. People were just in shock, giving statements to the cops, telling them about the kids on the jet skis who by that time were long gone. When we finally got back onto dry land, no one was in the mood to party. We just found a senior that could buy us some beers and just sat there in one of her hotel rooms, trying to process what we'd just been witness to. One of my brothers said that he's been flirting with her like minutes before everyone decided to jump in the water. About a half hour later, she was dead, and she died in one of the most horrific ways imaginable. 
We managed one more day down in Panama City before we decided to throw in the towel and drive back to Tuscaloosa. I remember hearing that Tori Lana's song that mentions jet skis in the bar the next day and thinking it was like a sick cosmic joke. And that's when you know you just need to go home. But yeah, be safe on the water people. It ain't no joke out there. When my Nana was very young, she was fortunate enough to have been able to meet her great-grandmother. The women in our typically Irish family tend to have their children at a young age, so it's not unusual for one of the older members of our clan to be able to meet their great-grandchildren before they shuffle off their mortal coil. Now, her great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, always wore black. She was a scathing but witty old dear, and if she didn't like you, she would say things like, May the cat eat you and the devil eat the cat. She was also a widow, lost her husband early on in their marriage, and stuck to her vow of perpetual mourning. The experience made her a deeply religious woman, too. I mean, every Irish person has a little of the church in them anyway, but she took her faith very, very seriously after losing her husband, and I think a lot of that is down to the circumstances in which she lost him. You see, my great-great-grandfather was a sailor in the Royal Navy, which wasn't unheard of back then since we were still subjects of the British Empire, and the ship he sailed on was named the HMS Wasp. Early one morning in the year of 1884, the crew of the HMS Wasp were given the task of ferrying a gang of bailiffs and police to this place called Anistrahal, a little island off the coast of Donegal. The police had nasty business to attend to as on the island, three poor families were no longer able to pay rent to the landowner and were due to be kicked out of their houses. When the sailors found out that they were abetting such cruelty, their hearts sank. The HMS Wasp has visited them previously, delivering a few sacks of potatoes when the islands were on the verge of starvation. They knew how hard life was for the poor islanders, who somehow eked out an existence on a rock that's less than half a square mile in size. The way my nana tells it, it was so early in the morning that the sun hadn't yet risen, but the crew of the wasp had sailed those waters many times before, and the veil of darkness was no hindrance to them. Yet somehow, the ship managed to collide with some rocks just off of a place called Tory Island. The ship went down fast, with only six of the boat's passengers and crews surviving the freezing cold waters. Fifty-two sailors, policemen, and bailiffs drowned that morning, with my great-great-grandfather being one of them. The incident was a huge scandal, and mainly because it emerged that the HMS Wasp had sunk directly within sight of a lighthouse. This meant that, by all accounts, they should have been well aware of their positioning in relation to rocks they knew well were there. So, as you can imagine, a great deal of rumor and mystery shrouded the ship's sinking, and one particular explanation seemed to capture the imaginations of the mainlanders. It was said that the folk who lived on Inistrahal Island had long been isolated from the Irish mainland and viewed mainlanders with contempt and suspicion. Hundreds of years before, Christianity had been slow to make its way over to Inistrahal, and legend speaks of a massacre that occurred there after many of the islanders refused to renounce their old gods. People said that there was still some who lived on the island that worshipped pagan deities, invoking ancient curses and performing blood sacrifices. So, when a ghastly theory emerged that the islanders had used a kind of cursing stone, known as a clock terre, to sink the wasp before it could land bailiffs on the island, people actually believed it. What's worse is that the story then tells of a local priest who heard of such ungodly practices and sailed to Anistrahal. There he located the clock to Ray and promptly hurled it into the ocean to cleanse the taint of paganism from the island. The same priest then safely made it back to the mainland where, by some horrible twist of fate, slipped and fell on a walkway one day and drowned in the river Finn. People were absolutely convinced it was the curse of the clock to Ray and my great-great-grandmother was one of them. Until the day she died, she believed something unholy had risen up from the ocean to take her husband away from her. Now obviously, I know that's just a silly old story my family tells, despite all my aunties swearing it's the God-honest truth. And I know because I actually did some research into the sinking of the HMS Wasp, but that didn't make what I found any less horrifying. 
The Royal Navy held an inquiry into the incident and were looking to court-martial the surviving sailors for negligence. Only one of the survivors had been on deck at the time of collision, and this man swore that the lights of the Tory lighthouse went dark not long before they hit the rocks. Since it was a routine journey for the crew, a junior officer was placed at the helm to gain some experience but was so lacking in that department that he was unable to navigate in the dark, hence the ship hitting those rocks. To me, the idea of the lighthouse going dark is much more feasible than any cursing stone or what have you. But that means that the people of Tory Island colluded with the people of Anistrahal to plunge the ship carrying their tormentors into darkness. The islanders killed 52 men that morning, all to avoid being evicted from their homes. Whether or not you can blame them is another question entirely and Given that I actually lost a relative in the incident, I don't think I can give you an unbiased answer. But the fact remains that 52 people found themselves plunging into the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean on a freezing winter's morning in complete darkness. Imagine the horror of slowly hearing the cries of your shipmates gradually falling silent until you yourself are taken by hypothermia. You certainly don't need a belief in the supernatural for that tale to give you the shivers. <laughs>